the vision of the new institute is beautiful because what it's going to do is it's going to raise up an exponentially broader army of Jesus lovers who can infiltrate, and I mean that in a good way, not a covert way, all the various strata of life with a life-giving story of Jesus. And what um, the current Ravi Zacharias world feels like to a lot of people is, wow, you got to be really smart to do that. Or you got to go to Oxford for a little while to check into that. Or you've got to want to be an apologist to li line up with that. And I think the Institute, the vision of it is, is that, look, these doors are open on small increments and large increments to anybody and everybody. What's a high school student who wants to come and be equipped, a university student, a mom, a tennis coach, a banker, anyone can come through the door really almost in any amount of time and energy they have to commit to the endeavor. And they can take advantage of the history, the training, the reputation, the resources of RZIM. And so I would imagine that in the next decade, tens of thousands of people are going to be shaped and launched by the impact of this new institute. And not just at the top level, pastors, teachers, educators, apologists, people like me, but all kinds of people going into all kinds of places to carry the story of Jesus to the world. The fruit of this new venture is going to be uh, impossible to gauge and measure on earth, but it's going to be stunning in heaven. Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to the Zacharias Institute, a new ministry of Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. RZIM. <laughs> RZIM includes a team of 71 apologists based in 16 different countries. And as of today, we have a permanent international headquarters and training institute based in America in Atlanta, Georgia. We are, we are excited, as you can see, and we are overwhelmed with gratitude to be standing in this facility. 5,000 people in more then 40 countries came together to support this vision and to make it a reality. The Zacharias Institute exists for the reason that RZIM has always existed, to help the thinker believe and to help the believer think. I'm Vince Vitale, the director of the Zacharias Institute, and I personally had my life changed by this ministry. When I arrived at college, I thought that Christianity was for people who didn't think hard enough. I had a friend who challenged me to read the Bible for the first time. And as I did, I began to fall in love with the person of Jesus and the life that he lived and the life that he calls us to. And I arranged meetings with my Princeton professors to find out where they found the answers to the deepest questions of life, questions of origin and meaning and morality and destiny. And many of them had no answers. But as I continued my research, Ravi and several others did have answers, and they were answers that made sense both to my head and to my heart. And in May of my freshman year, I put my trust in Jesus Christ. My story is too rare. A different story is too common. Some statistics suggest that as many as 70% of high school students who graduate high school as Christians are no longer active in their faith by the time they graduate college. 70%. That is a devastating statistic and one that has to change. The tagline of the Zacharias Institute is the questions of culture, the invitation of Christ. That's what I love about the ministry of RZAM. God asks us to worship him with our whole minds and with our whole hearts, and RZM is equally committed to both. One young man whom I saw become a Christian through this ministry, he said, you actually took my questions seriously, and I was surprised to find that there were decent answers. One young woman, when asked why she hadn't become a Christian sooner, she said, I think I just needed an invitation. 
How many of our neighbors, how many of our friends, our colleagues, our family members would accept an invitation, would join us in the life of faith if we would take their questions and objections seriously and if we would extend to them the invitation of Christ? Let's find out. The Zacharias Institute exists for those who are eager to find out the answer to that question. There is no better representation, I think, of what we long for here at this institute than the three people that we have to speak to you tonight at our inaugural event. Reverend Edmund Chan, Dr. Oz Guinness, and Dr. Ravi Zacharias. It's fitting that we begin this new initiative with Reverend Edmund Chan speaking on the heart of success redefined. We long for this institute to be successful. But what would that look like 10, 20, 50 years from now? How will we know if it has been successful? Edmund Chan is one of the world's finest leaders on discipling and mentorship. He was senior pastor of Covenant Evangelical Free Church in Singapore for 25 years. He then founded a global alliance of intentional disciple-making churches. And along the way, he's authored 10 books. He mentors top-level leaders in Singapore and beyond. These include CEOs, senior pastors, bishops, theological educators, national and regional ministry leaders. Pastor Edmund, it is a privilege and a joy to have you with us tonight. Thank you for making such a long trip uh, to be with us, and let's welcome him as he comes to share with us. Whenever I have a chance to introduce my friend Ravi Zacharias in Asia, I tell my Asian friends that Ravi and I have a mutual admiration club. He admires me, and I likewise admire myself. <laughs> Ravi, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm deeply honoured and humbled. I, I want to anchor our thoughts tonight in one of the profoundest prayer uttered by the Apostle Paul, and it's in Colossians chapter 1, from verse 9 onwards. And this is what Paul says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer and ask for His blessing as we open His Word. Heavenly Father, we ask you quieten the noisy workshop of our hearts and open our eyes to behold wonderful truth out of your word and help us to be not just hearers of your word but doers also that we might grow thereby. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What makes one person more successful than another person? Is it money? Is it fame? Or is it some outstanding abilities? Now, to answer that question, we must define or rather redefine success biblically. I want to begin with a short quiz. Now, before we do so, let me ask you, who learns better, serious adults or happy children? <laughs> happy children. Now, turn to the one next to you and say, you are a happy child. Okay, can I have the clock countdown, please? Thank you. You are a happy child, so are you ready for a quiz? Look intelligent and say yes. <laughs> now turn to your neighbour and say, My, you really look intelligent. <laughs> it's a simple quiz. It's a word, as a word association exercise, all right? I give you a word, you tell me the one word that comes to your mind. It's simple. Let's try. If I say Rolex, you say? Great. Toyota. Starbucks. Mont Blanc. Nike. Qantas. T. 
Tiffany, Hilton, Success, In our cultural narrative, success is a brand, and yet we find it so, so hard to define something like success. Different ones have different ideas, and as Christian disciples, we must come back to the scriptures in how God defines success for us. So let me cut to the chase. What is success? To the Christian disciple, success is spelled stewardship. Now the question is, what is stewardship then? I want us to understand stewardship in the context of it being rooted in the theology of ownership. True or false question. God wants us, true or false, God wants us to be faithful stewards of all that we own. True or false? God wants us to be faithful stewards of all that we own. It's a trick question. Because if we are to steward all that we own, we are the owners. It is more accurate to say God wants us to be faithful stewards of all that He owns and He entrusts to us to steward. You get the idea? That's the idea of stewardship. So the prevailing question is not how can I be more successful, but rather how can I be more faithful as a steward of God? There are three fundamental things for us to get right. Number one, get mission clear. Number two, be mission ready. And number three, stay mission true. Get mission clear, be mission ready, and stay mission true. I find these three things in, in Paul's prayer. Now, he did not write the book of Colossians to talk about success. He was addressing the Colossian heresy. He wasn't talking in this prayer and, and giving this prayer for success. He was telling them, now that you are growing, stay true. But I found implicit in these verses a spiritual compass that have helped me. I pray it will help you. And the spiritual compass is this, that God in His algorithm has given us not a magic formula for success, but a defining point for it. Right here in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 9 onwards. And tonight, I want to simply and succinctly unpack it for you. The first, get mission clear. You see, the mission of a firefighter is not to fight fires. The mission of a firefighter is to save lives and property through firefighting. We should not confuse the end with the means. So if the firefighter comes to a room and he's fighting a fire, and in the next room he hears a baby crying, he doesn't go, the mission of a firefighter is to fight fires. No, it is to save lives through firefighting. Once he gets his mission clear, his, his priorities are clear because his mission clarity is rooted in some core values and fundamental principles. Likewise, in the Christian life, our sense of stewardship must be rooted upon the fundamental principles and core value that God has given to us. What is the mission of, of the Christian ministry? We find in Paul's prayer, he says this to us. This is the defining point for success and stewardship. He says to us in verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Get this right, people. That's the measure, that's the yardstick. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You and I may have different assignments from God, different tasks He calls us to do, different mission, as it were, we engage in. But the fundamental call, and therefore our fundamental mission is to walk in such a manner that is worthy of the Lord. In the context, it's worthy of the redemption with which God has redeemed us. Therefore, our stewardship is rooted in the truth and reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a newness of life in, in the gospel because there is a redemption in the power of the gospel that changed human lives. 
It is the very gospel that gives us the power to transform human civilizations. And in that gospel, in the calling of Jesus, God calls us to walk in a manner worthy of the sacrifice He has made for us. G.K. Chesterton brilliantly said that the cross cannot be defeated, for it is defeat. The cross cannot be defeated, for it is defeat. I understand what he means by this to be the fact that Jesus embraced the cross, he embraced the defeat, the ultimate defeat was death. And he willingly and sacrificially embraced it through his life. And on the cross, in giving up his life, in the purity and the profundity of the perfect sacrifice, he has the power to raise us from the dead. That's the power of the gospel and redemption in the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, in the light of what God has done for us, He has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. Walk worthy of the calling of God, worthy of the Lord. That's the mission. That is what we need to be clear in what God calls us to do. I have learned there are three structures to life. The first structure are the superstructures. Our accolades, our accomplishments, the size of our organization or ministry. And, and very often, success is defined by the superstructures of life. But there are two other structures. The surface structure, my late mentor, Doug Sparks of the Navigators, call it where the rubber meets the road. This is where our family and our closest friend knows who we are and our walk, our surface structure. And then there's a third structure, the deep structures of life, the foundation, that which is unseen. And while we celebrate the accolades, the superstructure, and the whole world gravitates to defining success by our superstructures, God defines success not by our status of the superstructure, but by the very substance of the foundation and the substructures of our life. What is the foundation of your life? Upon what are we building? I have learned from the gospel, or from, from the scriptures, that the gospel is the very foundation of our life and our ministry. Now, Paul did not leave us to guess when he said, Axios, what worthy, in a manner worthy of the Lord. He did not leave us to guess what walking worthy means. He defines it in two markers. The first, to please Him in all respects. And the second, to bear fruit in every good work. Now, I believe that what Paul is doing is he's saying, look, there are these two defining markers in the Greek participle, and then there's a result. As, as you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord in doing two things, and that is to please Him and to bear fruit, you increase as a result in the knowledge, the true knowledge of God, in intimacy with Him, in communion, in anchoring with Him in the very life that God gives to us. Please Him and bear fruit. Now please notice the order in which it was given. Very often we define success in the fruit-bearing but the order that the apostle puts it is profound and important. He says the first, get this right, get your mission clear. The first is not to do many things for God. The first in what we do for God is to please Him and thereby to bear fruit. I call this the mission of the work and the mandate of the walk and the work must be cradled by the walk. Here's the problem in discipleship and ministry today. In Christian leadership, in the midst of pursuing success in ministry, we have often been so focused upon the work that our walk has been compromised. The defining point of success, God says, is to please Him and then to bear fruit. 
There is a second fundamental thing that is important in stewardship. The first, get mission clear, is about pleasing God, growing in knowledge of Him and bearing fruit. It doesn't mean fruit bearing is not important. It means we must get the order right. The second thing is we must be mission ready. How are we to get mission ready? If we are mission clear that the walk precedes the work and we have to do these two together in a manner pleasing to God, how are we to get mission ready? Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 gives us a clue. It says, Paul says, I pray for you, asking that you may be filled. The Greek verb is a deep and profound one. Pleruo, to be fully filled with the knowledge of His will. Some translators translate it as the full knowledge because it's a compound word in the Greek from the verb epigenosko or the now epigenosis. And it's a compound word that means the full, intense, intimate knowledge. So when you combine these two together, Paul is saying something very profound. He said, I pray for you that you might be fully filled with the full and complete and intimate knowledge of the will of God. Here's my point. If we want to be a faithful steward, we must know the will of God. We cannot come before God and say, Lord, I've done so many things for you in my life, only to hear God say, but I've never asked you to do these things. And the things I've asked you to do, you've missed altogether. Stewardship of life and ministry is directed to the call of God, and the call of God is directed in the light of His will. A full, intimate knowledge of His will. Some years ago, my esteemed friend Chip Ingram, president of World Teach, came to Singapore to be introduced as a new president. Uh, he was having a, a meeting with the leaders in the city. I was there, but I had lunch appointment. So I sat right behind. Immediately after he finished speaking, I, I went uh, from the back door. I was going out for the lunch appointment. He did not sit down after he speak. After he spoke, he, he went out of the side door and, and as I turned around the corner, we met. I said to him, thank you so much for your message. Introduce myself, I'm Edmund Chan. And then he embarrassed me by saying to me very kindly, in effect, you are Edmund, your reputation precedes you. I have a request. May I request to take your Bible teaching and package it in World Teach, like what they package in the Prayer of Jabez, and teach it to our tens of thousands of world teachers so that they can share it in different parts of the world. I said to Chip, I said, thank you so much. I am deeply honoured, but no thanks. He asked why. I said, because God didn't ask me to do that. He said to me, can we meet for breakfast tomorrow? I said, sure. So we met for breakfast. He was ready with his answer. He asked me the same questions again. Can we take your materials, package it? He said, the whole machinery of World Teach will be behind you. I said, no thanks. I gave him the same answer because God didn't call me to. Now, this time, he's ready with a response. His response was, but what about stewardship? If you have something good, don't you want to steward it so that more can benefit from what you have? And then I gave him an immediate answer, an answer when it came out of my mouth, I knew it was from God, because when it was coming out of my mouth, I thought to myself, wow, that was intelligent. <laughs> it cannot come from me. And the answer I gave to Chip Ingram is, Chip, the highest expression of stewardship is obedience. The highest expression of stewardship is obedience. The highest expression of stewardship is not do the mostest, do the best, do it the quickest. That's not the expression of stewardship. It is following the will of God. And I need to be clear, you need to be clear what God has called us to do in these times. Because in times such as these, so much is up for grabs. There are many opportunities and many dangers we need to come back to the will of God. But we cannot come back to the will of God if we are not rooted in the Word of God. That is why the greatest challenge in discipleship today is not readiness. 
I, I hear senior pastors saying to the staff, are you ready? The staff saying to the church, are you ready? The church saying to the young people, are you ready? I think it's a good question, but it's not a fundamental question. The fundamental question for life ministry is not are you ready, but are you rooted? Are you rooted in the Word of God? Are you rooted in the deep things of God? Are you rooted in sound doctrine? Because if you are not rooted, you will never be ready. To anchor in the will of God, we must be rooted in the Holy Scriptures because the Scriptures direct us and define for us what matters to God. His will. I know of Christians who want to know the will of God. Many years back, the navigators invited me to speak on knowing God's will. They, they gave me a, a room to address the, the group. But the people who signed up for that was, was overwhelming. Not because I was the speaker, but because of the topic, knowing God's will. They have to change it to a larger venue, a, a bigger a space. And I discover, this is probably 20 years ago or more, I discover then that there are many Christians who want to know God's will, but very few want to pursue and do God's will. Two different things. Lord, show me your will. I just want to know, and then I'll decide whether I want to do it or not. <laughs> I just want to know. So I want to perceive His will, but I'm not wanting to pursue it. When I study the life of Jesus Christ, I find something very staggering. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. He was not just wanting to perceive or even to pursue. It was an expression of a man preferring the will of God. And that's what we need to come to in our spiritual disposition and our spiritual pilgrimage. Not just to perceive and to pursue God's will, but to prefer his will. That's how we get mission ready, His will and His word. The final principle, the first is to get mission clear so that we can be a good steward. The second is to be mission ready. The third is to stay mission true. The Apostle Paul says this in a very beautiful way when he stated, you are to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And then he continued in verse 11, May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience. Now, these two words, endurance and patience, are two different things. In the context, endurance has to do with facing difficult circumstances and patience has to do with facing difficult people. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is whether you are, facing, are faced with difficult circumstances or difficult people, don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Press on in the mission that God has given to you to fulfill His redemptive will and purposes. Press on. We cannot be a good steward and therefore we cannot be successful in the eyes of God if we have not learned the secret of pressing on. That is key. About two years ago, I met with three top award-winning entrepreneurs, business owners. One of them, his business is a case study in Harvard Business School. We were in a mentoring time in a very beautiful island resort, and, and I asked these top three businessmen, what is the most important lesson that you've learned as a business leader and a business owner? And every one of them says, perseverance. They say, we've gone through difficult times, challenging times, but we learn to persevere. In order to be a faithful steward of God, we need to have endurance, long-suffering steadfastness, and patience in persevering through when we are faced with difficult circumstances or faced with difficult people. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. What is the secret to this? How, how do we persevere? The answer is already given by the Apostle Paul. This was his prayer. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Not our own power, but his. I'd like to close with a testimony in this short sharing of mine. There was a time I nearly gave up and I nearly gave up big time. This was 
30 years ago. I was a Bible college student. Uh, I came to the Lord when I was 10 years old in 1968. Backslided for four years in my high school. By God's grace, He called me back from my backsliding. I was on fire for God. It's all or nothing. And, and so I came back and I, I read the scriptures, went to the university for evangelism. I was on fire for God. And so God called me to, to uh, leave my occupation and, and to enroll in Bible college. In the first year of Bible college, I nearly gave up. How it happened was that a member of the church lent me a car to drive. I said to a missionary coming to Singapore, I can pick you up and s send you to my house and host you in my home. I'm staying in the Bible college. My flat is empty. You're welcome to use it. So I picked him up. I was driving the highway. The, the car broke down. Now, I, I don't own a car, so I don't know about cars. I don't even know why it broke down on the highway. I thought pastor's car are not supposed to break down. And in Singapore, when your car breaks down, nobody stops to help you. This missionary was very resourceful. He says, I know of a friend who could help. I'll call him. He called the friend. And while we are waiting for the friend to come, in a city where nobody stops for you, a huge lorry stopped, a truck stopped. And an Indian truck driver jumped up and asked, what's wrong? I didn't know what's wrong. He checked the car and he said, it's your battery, it's flat. So he took his jumper cable and he charged the battery. While he was charging the battery, the Lord spoke to me, shared the gospel with him. I don't know how. Oh, I've been in the universities for a number of times now sharing the gospel. When it comes to apologetics, uh, in those days, uh, Josh McDowell and, and C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton, uh, I, I'm familiar with their works and, and therefore I, I'm at home in the university. But how do I share a gospel with a lowly educated Indian truck driver? I don't know how. I, I, I didn't realize it then, but now I know. It was spiritual warfare and irrational fear. My heart was palpitating. By the time he finished, all I could say to him, thank you very much, God bless you, and he drove off. I went to the car and switched off the engine to save the battery. <laughs> you are car owners, you know you don't do that. You, you keep the engine running to charge the battery. I, I don't own a car, I didn't know. So I switched off and waited for the friend to come. We waved him off. Great, everything is fine. Jumped in the car, started again. It doesn't start. And nobody was there to help. But lo and behold, the same truck made a U-turn. <laughs> Same lorry driver jumped up and across the highway he shouted, what's wrong? And now I'm the educated one, I said, the battery. <laughs> and he did this, which to me was an international sign language for stupid. <laughs> he took that huge truck uh, battery, came over, charged it. And while he was charging it, God said to me the second time, Son, share the gospel with this man. You know what that is called? Second chance. <laughs> now here's my question. If you were given a second chance, would you have taken it? I didn't. I dare not. I panicked. My heart was palpitating. And, and all, all I could do at the end of it is to say, thank you, God bless you. He drove off. My whole world collapsed. I went back to Bible college. I told my wife and... I am not continuing anymore. I'm giving up. The next day, the lecture started. I did not go to the classes. And then the Lord spoke to me in my depression. Son, go to the chapel. I don't want to go to the chapel. Son, go to the chapel. So I put myself, dragged myself to the chapel, sat right behind, and the Lord spoke to me. Son, I want to use you and I can use you. And my immediate objection from my heart is, Lord, you, you can't use me. I've denied Christ, I've betrayed Him, I'm useless. Why do you want me to be in this chapel? I don't belong here. This is the company of saints. These are those who are preparing themselves for the full-time ministry. I am hopeless, I am worthless, I am a failure. You can't use me. And God said, no, son. I want to use you and I can use you. So I said to the Lord, Lord, to show you, you can't use me. I will cross the street at the Bible college. The first person 
who I meet, I will share the gospel with. The first person was a Chinese middle-aged lady. I was in my mid-twenties. I, I said to her, can I share something with you? And she went in Chinese some more. What? My, I am Chinese, but I don't know how to speak Chinese. In school, my, my English has always been uh, a, having a distinction and my Chinese is always a failure. And I thought to the Lord, oh no, I'd rather have an Indian truck driver. <laughs> but since I told the Lord, Lord, I just want to show you, you can't use me even if I'm willing. I shared with her the gospel in broken Chinese and, and broken Hokkien, which is a Chinese dialect, and perfect Oxford English. It was the worst sharing of the gospel in the history of the Christian church. And at the end of it, I asked her, would you want to receive Christ? And she said, yes. I couldn't believe it. Now my problem really starts. I don't know how to pray in Chinese. I have to say, come to the Bible college, get the Chinese-speaking student to share with her. I went back to my room and cried. And said, Lord, I'm sorry. I mistook what success is. I thought success is my strength, my intelligence, my training. Today I learned success is your strength, your grace, your empowering. I'm here, Lord. I'm available just to do your will. That's success, just to do the will of God. So people, what is success? Success is stewardship. To fulfill the will of God, to please Him, and to walk in faithful stewardship. Good night, and have a very successful pilgrimage ahead. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Edmund. That was the perfect message for us. As we begin this institute, I think one of the greatest temptations is to run ahead into good things rather than God things. There are so many good opportunities before us, and you just want to run ahead into all of them rather than really waiting and doing specifically what it is that God asks of us. So please pray uh, that we would be obedient. Thank you for being such a true friend uh, to this ministry. While, while you're in town, if there's anything at all that you need, don't hesitate to let me know, uh, except for my car. Uh, <laughs> You can't borrow my car. <laughs> uh, with such wonderful speakers, uh, many are taking notes, and uh, there are desks next to your seats. Uh, Margie asked me to point that out. As you tour this building tonight and as you see it tomorrow, you will find that, uh, in particular, Margie and her sister, Barb, there is such intentionality about every single detail uh, in this facility. I hope you'll be able to appreciate that as you walk around, and feel free to use those tables as you take your notes. Uh, next, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Oz Guinness on the heartbreak of our nation. Oz is a social critic that has spoken around the world in highly strategic settings, especially in academic, political, and business settings. He's a leading defender of religious freedom, and to my mind, he's one of the most profound thinkers of our time. He received his doctorate in the social sciences from the University of Oxford. He's a senior fellow at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, and he's the author of more than 30 books. Oz writes roughly as fast as I read. Uh, recently, Oz tweeted this line. He said, be known for your love of people who disagree with you radically. Be known for your love of people who disagree with you radically. And Oz preaches that, he also practices it. About two weeks ago, I was with Oz and a team from RZIM sharing Christ on the campuses of UC Berkeley and Stanford. Oz, Oz's talks were masterful, but even more noteworthy were the hours-long conversations that he had with undergraduate students about the gospel, often starting early in the morning and stretching late into the night. One of those students named Bailey put her faith in Christ on the Friday after journeying with us throughout that week. It is very rare to find someone like Oz who has the mind to be able to zoom out and see the trajectory of history and culture and institutions and yet also has the heart to zoom into an individual's life 
and to be up well past midnight loving and listening well to an undergraduate student that he disagreed with. I have no doubt that Oz could have won that argument in three minutes. But he wasn't interested in winning the argument. He was committed to winning the person. It is so appropriate to have Oz speak on the heartbreak of our nation because I believe he truly understands both nations and hearts. Oz, it's an honor to call you my friend and my teammate. And please come share with us. Thank you, Vince. What a tremendous privilege it is to be here on this uh, great occasion. Ravi gave me the topic, the heartbreak of our cities. I thought about it and I thought, that's Jackie Lull or Tim Keller, but that's not really me. And so we arranged this one. And I hope all of you watching around the world who are not American realize I don't do this out of chauvinistic reasons, speaking about America, but because there's so much at stake for the gospel in this country, which for better or worse at the present moment is the world's lead society. Jenny and I came here in 1984 for six months. And 32 years later, we're still here. When we arrived in the middle of President Reagan's re-election, the slogan, which some of you remember, was Morning in America. I remember arguing that actually it was late afternoon, maybe evening in America. But you can see 30 years later, the world, even that Americans knew then, has gone. One of you said to me in the reception that after many years abroad, you didn't recognize the country to which you've come back. The United States is suffering its gravest crisis since the Civil War. And there is no Lincoln in the land. And there's very little statesmanship. And many of the deepest answers don't delve down to the heart of the problem. And I believe we who follow Jesus because of the past, but above all because of the gospel, have a unique moment to speak into this great country. I grew up in China. My family and I lived in Nanjing, which was then the capital, and in the Ming Dynasty had been the capital of the whole of China. In the 15th century, you could say China was the most advanced country in the world. The richest, the most technologically advanced, with incredible inventions all around, amazing learning, and adventuring that went round much of the world. But as the Chinese acknowledge, in just one century, and then for five centuries, China was surpassed by the West. And in the last generation, the Chinese have said, why? As some of you know, and Neil Ferguson describes in his book, Civilization, there was a discussion at the Chinese Academy of the Social Sciences as to why the West suddenly leapfrogged the greatness of China and went from being a cultural backwater to being the most influential civilization in the world. Was it the Western guns? No, they said. Was it the Western economy? A little bit, they said, but not really. Was it the Western political system and the rule of law? A little bit that too, but also not fundamentally. What was it then? It was, in their words, religion, the Christian faith. Now, our Jewish friends immediately said, wait, wait, wait a minute. That happened in the 16th century. But the Christian faith had been around, dominant in the West, since the 4th century in Rome, and never, ever looked like rivaling any other great civilization. What was it? And the Jews pointed out, it was the Reformation. And through the Reformation, the rediscovery of so much of the greatness 
of the Old Testament. And many rabbis argue that Calvinism is as near to Judaism as you see in any branch of the Christian church. Now this, as you know, is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Of course, it was a mixed movement. Blind spots, contradictions, unforeseen consequences. But we can glory and thank the Lord for what the Reformation did for the church. The recovery of the gospel. The recovery of the scriptures. And the recovery of lay people. But we also need to think of what the Reformation did for the wider world. And you can see that many historians would say that the Reformation made the modern world, if partly, despite itself. But what were the truths in the Reformation which so shaped the modern world? Two above all. Calling, purpose, dynamism, entrepreneurialism, think of Max Weber and the rise of capitalism, and covenant. Covenant, which became constitution and lies behind the American constitution. Now, many countries were shaped by the Reformation. Germany, Holland, Switzerland, Scotland, England. But this country is truly the land the Reformation made. And yet, all these centuries later, we can see the profound chaos in American culture today and greater divisions politically, economically, socially, culturally, religiously, racially, as I said, that at any moment, going back to just prior to the Civil War. This country is in a grave crisis. Now, we haven't time, and this is not the place to analyze why. But let me just mention three features of where we are today and then draw some conclusions in terms of our apologetics. First, there's no question that we're facing a decisive rejection of the founders and the founding. Not among all Americans, thank God, but among many of the intellectual elite. Why? Start with the founder's blind spots. Slavery, women, the Native Americans. There's no question that the silence in the convention in Philadelphia in 1787, the silence over slavery, was a deliberate Faustian bargain. If they had mentioned slavery, the southern states would never have signed on. So even many of those who on principle fiercely opposed slavery were silent. And the disaster was written into the Constitution. And racism has become the abiding curse of America as things like class are in England and other problems elsewhere. And you can see that while there were times, say, under Martin Luther King, when the response to it was a Christian response, taking the Declaration of Independence as a promissory note and cashing it in for those who didn't receive its benefits earlier. Now, though, people using ancient grievances, which they themselves have not suffered, to stir up modern factions and rivalries and grievances and the problems grow worse. The second way the founders were rejected was those who claimed to see through them. Quasi-Marxist nonsense and so on that said this was their real agenda, the economic interests and so on. And you can see from Charles Beard and downwards, many in the elites have done that again and again. And the third and very common way of dismissing the framers was to say they were brilliant in their time, but their times were those times and they're outdated. And you can see the whole notion of progressive politics from Woodrow Wilson down to Barack Obama passing on the framers because they no longer apply. Or think of someone like Dean Acheson. The problem, he said, of running the United States is 
Then we've got the constitution of an 18th century farmer's republic dealing with global nuclear issues. In other words, impossible. And of course, for many Americans, they just forget the founders. I heard one Ivy League student who wrote the declaration, George Washington. Well, no, wait, wait, it was Abraham Lincoln. Oh, sorry, it was Winston Churchill. <laughs> and you can see a general ignorance surrounding history at large and the founders. We talk of Republicans in name only, but the tragedy is that America has become a republic in name only. And of course, the republic was grounded in the constitutional freedom which went back through New England to the notion of covenant. The second thing we can see, equally sad, is a bizarre adoption of alien ideas. Some of you remember when Timothy McVeigh was arrested after the Oklahoma City bombing. And if you remember, he was arrested wearing a sweatshirt or a t-shirt with a quotation from Thomas Jefferson. What Jefferson had written to Abigail Adams on the occasion of Shays' Rebellion. The tree of liberty is often refreshed by the blood of tyrants and patriots because that is its natural manure. Jefferson said worse than that. When the French Revolution broke out and the reign of terror started, he excused it and condoned it and said the injustices were so great that the whole thing should burn down so long as there was a single Adam and Eve left to start all over again. And of course, a third of a million French were killed in that revolution. Jefferson, thank God, was out of step with most of the founders. Washington and Mason and Adams and many of the others, they had a notion of ordered liberty, very different from that destructive Jacobin liberty of Jefferson. And Jefferson himself, when the revolution was taken over by Napoleon, renounced it later on with a considerable hypocritical turn. But here's my point. If you see how the French Revolution is so decisively different from the American Revolution, you can see how bizarre it is that many of the ideas flowing through America in the last century are closer and owe more to the French Revolution than they owe to the American Revolution. As late as the 1950s, America is often described as a liberal order with a capital L. A commitment to freedom and ordered freedom and to justice, a liberal order. But it shifted to a liberal left order in a very, very different sense recently. Think of some of the movements. Multiculturalism. The American motto is a pluribus unum. Out of many, the earlier motto. Out of many, one. In other words, you need to know the one. You need to know the identity. But in 1908, when Horace Callan first wrote on multiculturalism, the idea that the ethnic cultures are, quote, unmeltable, you can't change your grandfather, as he put it, it gave rise to the idea that no one really needs to adapt to their host country. The host country needs to adapt to them. Now, that idea didn't make great headway when it first came out. And after World War I, there was a period of very powerful, even coercive nationalism. But in the 1970s, it re-erupted. And it became the ruling philosophy, not only here, but in Europe. And of course, it's behind the French banlieue, the British no-go areas, the so-called dish cities in Sweden, and all that. And it's been disastrous in each of them. But it's particularly disastrous here because now everything is diversity, but there's no unum. Out of diversity, one. A pluribus, but there's no unum. Civic education collapsed in the 1960s. And you can see with the discussion of immigration now whether some talk of walls and some talk of sanctuary cities. Nobody talks of civic education 
and how immigrants come to this country and become Americans. And as scholars have pointed out, increasingly immigration puts more of a stamp on this country than the revolution. And many of the most important fundamental things are lost. Or take a second trend that's gone through. We look at the ravages of postmodernism, which AZAM has tackled in all sorts of ways. And particularly the way it's developed into what's called social constructionism. For the Stoics and the Classics, and certainly for anyone who follows the Bible, there is a natural order, as we read in Genesis. God made the world a certain way. Heaven is heaven, earth is earth, male a male, female a female, and so on. There's an order, a created order. For the Stoics, a natural order, not today. For the social constructionists, there are no givens, there are no rules, there are no limits. So you can be whatever you want to be. And you can see much of the current discussion through Judith Butler and the gender revolution is on male-female. But you can equally see in much of the radical talk, it's not just life and death, but even humans and the divine. Yuval Harari's latest book, you can see the whole thing in the title, Homo Deus. No longer Homo Sapiens, his earlier book, Homo Deus. With our technology and our science and our information, what he calls datarism, we can truly be as God and a refueling of that Babel drive all over again. Or we think of the sexual revolution. Many people I know just view the sexual revolution through the lens of people they know. How can I argue with my sister-in-law? Well, my colleague is this, and who am I to speak out? Or they view it as a kind of wayward child of the 1960s and the three Ps, permissiveness, the pill, and playboy. But if any of you looked into the roots of the sexual revolution, it goes back quite literally to the French Revolution. And you can see the influence, say, of Jean-Jacques Rousseau on the Marquis de Sade, playing out in the young Shelley in England, fortunately stopped there in his tracks by the evangelical revival, and then playing out by many people down the centuries, uh, down the decades since then, above all, Wilhelm Reich, who wrote The Sexual Revolution, which is behind so much of it coming right down to our own time and the people in this area. And you can see that it shares all the marks of the French Revolution. The utopianism. Man is born free, but he is everywhere in chains. Just remove the chains, take away the oppression, and everything will be fine. And you can see the enormous naive utopianism behind so much of this. And of course, right from the very beginning, the one great obstacle to freedom, religion. Above all, Roman Catholics and evangelicals. And what was absolutely remarkable was reading some of the WikiLeaks leaks of the people around John Podesta and his former Catholic friends and how they exactly mirrored the complaints against the church by Wilhelm Reich and other people writing back in the 1920s. Religion in general, but the Christian faith and the church in particular, is something that's the obstacle to their success of freedom for everyone. And of course, you can see the appeal. The old categories of proletariat and all that sort of stuff are transcended. You just have reactionaries and progressives. And who would argue in sexual freedom? And so it goes. But you can see a whole series of ideas which have just flown through from the French Revolution, having profound effect today in the country that gave us the American Revolution so decisively different. The third feature of our time that strikes me as a look at where we are now is the sad scandal of the American church. We look at the church worldwide, and as you all know, the church is exploding around the global south. 
Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, not doing well anywhere in the West. And as you know, the sting in the tail is that much of the global South is pre-modern, and what's done in much of the church in the West is its capitulation to the modern world. But you have to add to that the sadness of the scandal of the American church. Because if we look at Europe, many of us know that well too, in almost every European country, the church, for various sad and historical reasons, is a tiny minority. But in America, we are a huge majority, and yet having no cultural influence. Take other tiny groups, our Jewish friends whom I love. The Jews love to point out that they are so tiny numerically, they don't amount to a tiny statistical error in a Chinese census. <laughs> Look at their Nobel laureates. Look at their influence in the financial world. Look at their shaping of Hollywood and all sorts of other areas. Put it mildly, the Jews punch above their weight. Or we could take groups that we disagree with, respectfully but radically, like the LGBTQ groups. Less than 2% of America. But with far more cultural influence than we who are followers of Jesus and called to be salt and light. And you can see in this country the confusion and demoralizing how many Christians simply don't know how to engage with culture. And often they only engage with the most simplest of the hostile ideas and almost never with the distorting, shaping powers of modernity. And to me, it's a scandal that on the 500th year of the anniversary of the Reformation, all that many of our evangelical magazines are discussing is the Benedict option of strategic withdrawal. Nothing could be more of an insult to our Lord's call and to the genius of the Reformation and the way through calling it gave an inner asceticism that really took people out into culture and changed the modern world profoundly. What does this mean for us, though, as we move out as people who love apologetics, or I like to use the word Christian advocacy? First, in terms of America, I think it means the deepest crisis is a crisis of freedom. Many people look at where we are today and all worried about the president. Yes. The president didn't cause the crisis. The crisis caused the president. But far beyond anything to do with the current administration, the problem isn't the Democrats and the Republicans or conservatives and liberals in the traditional sense or even the heartlanders and the coastals or even the current trendy phrase, the globalists and the nationals. The deepest divisions go back to two very different ideas of freedom, one coming from the American Revolution shaped by the gospel and one coming from the French Revolution shaped by the secular enlightenment. Freedom requires truth in the biblical understanding. Freedom requires power in the Enlightenment understanding. Freedom being, begins with the inner and moves to the outer in the biblical understanding. Freedom starts with the outer and is imposed on the inner in the French Revolution understanding. Freedom is both negative, freedom from and positive freedom for in the biblical understanding. Freedom is only negative in the French understanding, and so it goes. Freedom always has to be within ethics and under the Lord and accountable in the biblical understanding. Freedom is absolutely a total, infinite, absolute freedom without any accountability. 
you have very, very different views of freedom. And I think today, we who follow Jesus, it's a sober moment to realize that we are the last great defenders, along with our Jewish friends, the last great defenders of a full, rich, deeply based human freedom. And whether it's atheism or many of these other views, they're denying things that are essential to it and leading countries as well as individuals towards disaster. The second thing to see, and I don't need to add to what Pastor Chan said so well, the crisis for the church is a crisis of faithfulness. He put it so well, I'll add nothing there. But one other point. The crisis for apologetics includes the element of the prophetic. What do I mean? Part of the glory of AZAM, for which I thank God, and is one of the reasons that Jenny and I are so deeply committed to it and why I was attracted to it, is that it's not just theoretical. It's practical, as Vince was saying. Not just talking apologetics, but winning real people as well as arguments. But you can see in the world that we're in today, that means on the one hand being deeply personal and deeply pastoral. Because whether we're talking about freedom or the sexual revolution or anything, these are individuals who are caught up in the wheels and the machinery of all these great movements which are chewing people out and leaving them lonely and distressed and upset in all sorts of ways. Real people. So everything has to be profoundly personal and profoundly pastoral, as Vince was saying. But at the same time, there are big ideas and they are capturing big institutions. And just as the prophets address truth to power and truth to kings and to priests and so on, I think the people of God today have to be able to shift and know when we're talking to the individual in a deeply personal and pastoral way, or whether we're really addressing ideas which are crippling and undermining this great country. We need to have the prophetic as well as the personal and the pastoral to have a fully rounded approach to our culture at the present moment. What a time. What a time. Many of you heard me say that when I was at Stanford on one of the previous occasions, a student asked me, if you, if you could be born in any generation except your own, which would you choose? I had no idea where they were coming from. All sorts of fancy answers flashed through my mind in the half second you have to think before answering. And being born in China, I thought of great Chinese dynasties. As an Englishman, I immediately thought of some of our great periods, including the 18th century of William Pitt and William Wilberforce. And of course, your own founding generation is quite extraordinary, even with their blind spots. But what came to me was, I'd like to be a member of your generation, I said to them. Because those under 40 are described as the crunch generation. In the sense that in our global era, many of the great issues of the world are converging to create an enormous crunch of problems which will need answering. Economic, technological, scientific, nuclear, environmental, you can name it. They will have to be answered in their lifetime if humanity is to sail forward calmly. And of course, as we look down to the future, Singularity, post-humanism, artificial intelligence, the problems are confounding. What a time for us to live in. When I knew Francis Schaeffer well, he often used to love to quote Luther. And Luther's simple idea that if you fight the battle at any point in your time, except the place it's being fought in your time, you might as well not fight the battle. A lot of Christians, sadly, are simply missing out altogether. I thank God for Ravi and Margie and AZAM and these magnificent colleagues you'll hear from over the next 24 hours. 
and I praise the Lord for the provision of this magnificent institute. May it, along with the magnificence of Ocker and Oxford, really by God's grace, make a dent in the extraordinary times in which we're living. May we be picking up from Edmund Chan. May we, like David, as it said in the book of Acts, serve God's purpose in our own generation and then fall asleep. Thank you, Oz. Every time I hear from you, my understanding of the gospel is enlarged. Uh, and so often the objections and the questions that we're dealing with today, as Oz knows better than anyone, can be traced back to ideas from two and three generations earlier. May we contend as a ministry today for ideas so that our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren can be living in a culture that looks different than the one that we're looking uh, that we're living in right now, and one that would be more favorably disposed to the message of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Oz. Our uh, age has been called the great age of apologetics. This is something that Oz has written about. Modern technology and social platforms has allowed every question and every objection to be on our doorstep. It also gives us an unprecedented opportunity to answer those questions on a global scale right now, and in the next 24 hours, this event, these talks, will be heard by people in dozens of countries. And over the next year, we'll be having training events and programs at the Zacharias Institute for youth, for pastors, for business leaders, for artists, in collaboration with our on-site gallery, Still Point, for emerging apologists, and not just for experts, but for anyone who's eager to deepen their faith. Many of the greatest thinkers and speakers in the world will be joining us, and most of these events will be live streamed across the globe, and so they'll be available to anyone with a computer or a phone. We're living in the great age of apologetics. The question that remains is which apologetic will win the day? People often ask us as a team which questions are becoming more and more common, and one type of question one cluster of questions that we're receiving more and more frequently have to do with depression and suicide. And it's not hard to see why. Each of us sees about 3,000 advertisements per day. And pretty much every one of those advertisements is telling you that you're not good enough, is telling you that you need just one more product in order to be worthy of love. This is the most connected generation of all time. It's also the most lonely generation. The apologetic of the Christian faith offers something radically different, a message that is life-giving rather than life-taking, a heaven-sent message. Ravi is the person to talk to us about this message because he has lived it with integrity for 50 years. He began on a bed of suicide, and then the Bible was read to him, and in it he found life. Now, if you travel with Ravi, you will regularly hear him praying through the walls of his hotel room out loud. You will see how he remembers every name of every bellman who holds a door for him, every waiter or waitress who serves him. Whoever he is speaking with, he looks directly at them like they're the only person in the room. Ravi always says what you win people with is what you win people Two, Ravi has won people with integrity and respect and kindness. Thank you letters to Ravi stream in from all over the world. And they don't usually start by talking about how impressive his thoughts or his arguments were. They start by saying, thank you for the respect that you showed me. Thank you for the kindness that you showed me. Thank you for treating me like someone who mattered. The more you get to know Ravi, the more impressed you are with who he is. I personally have never met someone who, while being so successful at what they do, is so full of humility and grace. Dr. Ravi Zacharias is founder and president of Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Many know that he has presented the claims 
of Christianity on the campuses of the top universities in the world, Harvard, Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge, Dartmouth, UPenn, John Hopkins, and many others. Many don't know that Ravi gave the commencement address at Covenant Day School in Matthews, North Carolina to 70 graduating seniors because 10 years earlier he promised a dying friend that he would speak at his son's graduation and Ravi always honors his promises. Many don't know that Ravi was honored with the title of secret reader at his grandson's preschool. <laughs> I heard Ravi was more nervous to speak to that group of four-year-olds than he was when he spoke to an audience of 10,000 the week before. And that doesn't surprise me because I know that that preschool event would have been just as important to him as any other event on his schedule. Dr. Zacharias has twice spoken at the annual prayer breakfast at the United Nations in New York. In 2008, he served as the honorary chairman of the National Day of Prayer, which included giving addresses at the White House and the Pentagon. Dr. Zacharias has authored or edited more than 25 books, and he has been conferred with nine honorary doctorates. Ravi, uh, to serve alongside you is the honor of a lifetime. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ravi Zacharias. I leaned over to Margie and said, maybe I really should not speak. Uh, we've had a banquet already, and frankly, I feel I'm intruding almost like some rancid nuts after a huge main course uh, that has been, I, I kid you not, I mean, listen to Edmund Chan and Oz. Uh, Oz uh, asked Jenny to do me a favor. This is bad news and good news. If you predecease me, I would love your jacket <laughs> because I have a feeling those notes are pinned in there. He comes up here with nothing in his hand. And listen to that stuff that flows out of him. You know, Pascal sewed his testimony into his jacket. So maybe you've got some notes in there, Oz. I don't know if he wears any other jacket. That's the only jacket I've ever seen him in. And uh, so there has to be something to that jacket. Uh, I think my colleagues will agree with me. Absolutely amazing stuff. And uh, thank you so much for what it is you shared, Oz. Amazing what God's done for you, through you. Uh, he's only a few years older than I am, but uh, when I was a young undergraduate, I was reading his stuff then. And uh, of course, greatly influenced by the famed uh, Francis Schaeffer has carried on that light and that legacy to analyze, uh, but he doesn't just analyze, he gives a prescription. So thank you all for coming and thank Jenny for sparing you. You mean an awful lot to the team. Edmund, what a delight to have you, my friend. Uh, this man has been an encourager for many, many years and really inspired me along the way. I don't think a week goes by, but that I get either a verse or a line or two from him to just thank us for our friendship that we have. And uh, as you've ministered today, you've said a lot that we need to follow and emulate. God bless you and please thank Han for sparing you for this long journey, he flies back tomorrow all the way to Singapore, and that's, uh, I follow him two days later, I've just come back from the Orient and heading on to Malaysia uh, just a day after tomorrow myself, moving on to do some meetings in Kuala Lumpur and Kota Kinabalu, so we sometimes pass each other in the air. <laughs> nice to see you all, it's so nice to see Danny and Shireen, what a wonderful privilege to see you guys, our Syrian friends, both studying at Liberty, now Shireen entering her doctoral work, and in an amazing uh, uh, pursuit of knowledge and apologetics. So many parts of the world are represented here. We'll take a few moments to recognize you tomorrow, but this is a dream unfolding. Well, these are only bricks and mortar. Uh, in fact, the gentleman who helped us procure the building is here today too. Uh, the architects are here, those who helped us with the furniture and the furnishings, they're all here. Thank you to all of you for all that you've done to make this possible, and uh, we'll say a word about them tomorrow as well, those who worked hard for this. And I know some of you are flying out overseas. I just want to thank you for your contribution. Uh, 
halfway through the mark, I was joking and telling my team when you finally own this building, just dig a plot at the back here because it's going to take me with it. You may as well put me six feet under. I'm doing everything I can to make this possible. But here it is, a, re a reality because of your kindness, your generosity. All of you were involved so much in this and a handful who couldn't be here. I just want to express my deep thanks to them and to my Lord for them. You know, I have a colleague on my staff, and his name is Sanj Kalra. You recognize him by his hair. Uh, what I lost, the Lord gave to him. And uh, he keeps telling us it doesn't happen by accident, although sometimes when I look at it, I think it is an accident. He just, he's the fashion model for our team. He issues me fashion violations repeatedly and uh, keeps us humored. So what you're about to see is something that he showed me some time ago, and here's my question for you. When you think of zeal, enthusiasm, vibrancy, and eagerness, what illustration would come to your mind? To me, this one does, and I'm going to have these gentlemen turn it on for you. Hopefully, it'll come through properly. Watch this now. That is hilarious. <laughs> The guy's droning on and on, you know, saying this boy's waited a long time for this. And so the little guy says, just do it. And yet his head buried in the water. John the Baptist would be very, very proud of him. So when I think of zeal now, that's the picture that comes to mind. And uh, I've given Sanj due credit for giving that to us. The message is heaven sent. That's really what I want to talk about. And frankly, so much has already been said, some of the material just like that, which I want to reinforce to you. But in the Gospel of John, I want to read for you the first 13 verses. Listen to them. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made, made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to every man who was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. And as I was reading that text while I was overseas a few days ago, I thought, that verse there, that verse 13, so much like the virgin birth itself. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or even a husband's will, but born of God. Merrill Tenney, the famed professor and scholar of years ago, gives an introduction to the Gospel of John that is riveting. It made an impression upon me in my undergraduate studies, and I found the book, dished out where I had underlined it, and I want to read for you two or three paragraphs of what it is Metenny says about the Gospel of John. There are themes that emerge, light, darkness, belief, unbelief, reasoning, logos, argument, and the beginning that God himself could only explain. But there are two other themes that actually emerge, and that is the fact that this message is heaven sent, and he was a heavenly sent messenger to bring to us this message, and that you and I are now those witnesses. The idea of a martyr, the marturion, is the concept that keeps emerging. But listen to what Tenney says in two or three paragraphs. There are two aspects in this story, because there are two aspects to the person of Christ, the human and the divine. As a portrayal of human struggle, the Gospel of John is a deep tragedy. 
all the worst of human passions and behaviors, all the utmost of human suffering and failure are adequately set forth. Jealousy, avarice, hatred, envy, lust, duplicity, disloyalty, ingratitude, stupidity, brutality, hypocrisy, spite, and every other evil motive or quality are illustrated in the actions of this drama. Conversely, unselfishness, generosity, kindliness, purity, honesty, sincerity, and self-sacrifice may also be found. Apart from divine intervention, as in all great tragic literature, evil would triumph, and in the crucifixion, the tale would have ended sadly and disappointingly. More than this, the tragedy is ironical. The more humanity struggles against evil, the more deeply it gets involved in it. For instance, Peter avowed that he would never forsake his Lord, but that he would lay down his life for him. The exact opposite occurred. In the life of Jesus himself, irony is apparent. Although he was virtuous, he suffered all possible indignities. Majestic, he died in ignominy. Powerful, he expired in weakness. Particularly is this fact illustrated by his claims as they contrast with his end. He claimed to possess the water of life, but he died thirsting. He claimed to be the light of the world, and he died in darkness. He claimed to be the good shepherd, and he died in the fangs of wolves. He claimed to be the truth, but was crucified as an imposter. He claimed to be the resurrection and the life. He expired sooner than most victims of crucifixion usually did, so that Pilate was amazed. Strangely enough, the culmination of his career seemed to give the lie to its intended meaning. If the greatest exemplar of righteousness that the world has seen became a helpless victim of evil, then supreme tragedy is the burden of the Gospel of John. But from the divine perspective, the fourth gospel is not tragedy, but triumph. The plot reveals victory of life over death, of love over hate, of light over darkness, and of the spirit over the flesh. The true culmination is not in the crucifixion, but in the resurrection. Unbelief does its worst at the cross and halts there. Faith holds on to the resurrection and so becomes victorious. The divine word has not triumphed by being revealed in contrast to the world as a mystic vision untouched by the sordid realities of life, but rather by undergoing the worst that life could do and by rising above it unscathed. Nor is this vision splendid only in a dream by which men delude themselves into thinking that they triumph over the world, though actually they do not. Its call to faith produces a new practical reality for daily living. What an incredible introduction to the gospel given so many decades ago. That it seems to end in tragedy, yet through the eyes of faith and the knowledge of the gospel writers, there is victory that doesn't circumvent or get aside all of these debauched expressions of the human mind, but they go through it and comes out triumphant on the other side. You see, it's not in spite of the dark mystery of evil, said James Stewart. It's through it that God actually triumphed and conquered. And so as we look at what it is that God is calling us to do in a time like this, I think of that famous essay of F.W. Borum, The Candle and the Bird. And he talks about in these terms. He said, you know, if you... If you Turn the light out of a candle, you extinguish it, there is darkness. He said, but if you frighten a bird, it'll go and sing its song on another bough. He said, the gospel is more like a bird than it is a candle. You cannot really extinguish it. You push away and resist the Holy Spirit. He will go and do his work in another part of the world. And you see this happening repeatedly in history. When Addison was mourning the loss of Puritanism in England, at that very time, Count Zinzendorf, with his little band of young men in the age in their 20s, 
were meeting at Heron Hut and launched the Moravian movement. It was the Moravians that inspired Wesley. It was the Moravians that inspired uh, William Carey. In fact, when Carey threw down the gauntlet in front of his leadership, he had the annals of the Moravians put down at the table and said, they're sending missionaries all over the world. Why aren't we doing the same? The day the cross was being burned at Notre Dame in France, the very day in Paris, William Carey was setting his foot on Indian soil. There he baptized Adoniram Judson, who went on to Burma. And then his wife wrote, translated the Bible into Thai, and the Burmese Bible and the Thai Burma Bible came about just through the Judson family, and it was through the inspiration again of Kerry. The bird is singing its song in many parts of the world. We are not extinguishing the candle. We are just watching what the bird is doing and in the different boughs of the world that it is singing its song. How does this happen? How does this come to be? It's going to be my privilege to speak in a few parts of the world at the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, which was so ably mentioned here by Oz a few moments ago. Just think about it. You know, 500 years have gone by. And Martin Luther took his stand and said that unless through scripture he could be challenged and be proven wrong, he would not recant. But I want to point out a real nuance in that Reformation movement. We know there were many, of course, Wycliffe was the morning star of the Reformation, then there was Huss, then there was Savonarola, and then there was Calvin and Luther and Zwingli, so many of them like a tidal wave moving and changing history at that time. But in the, it was 1973 when I was in East Germany with John Warwick Montgomery who was doing a Reformation study tour. I remember walking to the castle church there standing outside the door. It was in the days of the Cold War, and very predictably, being December, it was foggy and cold and clammy. And I stood in front of the Castle Door Church and wondered, what must have been it been like for that man to come and nail those 95 theses to the door, beginning with the words, out of zeal and love for the elucidation of the truth, the following theses will be debated out of zeal and love for the elucidation of truth, following the following thesis we debated. There's a book written about Melanchthon, who was the theologian of the Reformation, and it's called The Unrecognized Reformer. See, it was he who pointed to Luther that the word penance really meant repentance. It was he who graduated from university as in his teens, he went in at 13, graduated by 16. In his early 20s, he was a professor of theology at Wittenberg. In his early 30s, he wrote the Augsburg Confession. Martin Luther describes himself in contrast to Melanchthon. I am rough, boisterous, and stormy. I am born to fight against innumerable monsters and devils. I must remove stumps and stones, cut away thistles and thorns, but Master Philip comes along gently and softly, sowing and watering with joy according to the gifts which God has so abundantly bestowed upon him. Melanchthon said of Luther, if there is anyone whom I dearly love and whom I embrace with my whole heart, it is Martin Luther. And the biographer says this about both of them, by his fiery eloquence, his genial humor, and his commanding personality, Luther commended the Reformation to the people. By his moderation, his love of order, and his profound scholarship, Melanchthon won for it the support of the learned, the lovely, and the and pleasant in their lovely and pleasant in their lives. They toiled, prayed, and suffered for the same great cause. And in death, they are not divided. They literally lie side by side in their graves at the Castle Church in Wittenberg. They died at the same age, 63, except Melanchthon was younger by about 14 years, so he preached at Luther's funeral. And as I walked into that church, I thought, of my, thought to myself, these guys were young men. They took on the world. They challenged the world. They stood with the word of God, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. 
the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we shall endure or can endure. One little word will fell him. Amazing change of the course of history half a millennium ago. Is it impossible for God to do the same at this time in history through teams like this, through the lives of people like Edmund and, and Oz and those who've gone on, who've left a legacy, people like Francis Schaeffer and so on. So I want to talk to you very quickly. What are the challenges we really face in our time? The first one I hesitate to talk about because it's not a subject I like to often get into. But, you know, a few days ago, I was, I think, somewhere in, uh, I don't know which country I was in, somewhere overseas in Asia. <laughs> it's about 10 days ago. And Ruth and our staff sent me a lead article in a student newspaper in one of the leading newspapers in the leading universities of this country. When I read it, I started to cry. I said, I can't believe what I've just read. I cannot believe what I've just read. Then I thought to myself, how did this even come into my email? There were so many four-letter words sprinkled through it in the crudest form of sexual indulgence, from autoeroticism to polyamorous relationships, name it, it was there. And this young gal who's writing in a newspaper as a student, verbalist, verbally voyeuristic, telling everything of all she does and all she's done from the time she was a young teen. You say to yourself, is this what our education wants to be talking about? Is this it? Is this why you go to a university to graduate with letters against your name? To tell everybody? All the struggles you have in your private world, only not talking about his struggles, but in a cavalier way of indulgence and sexuality. And so it is, oftentimes, the Dawkins and the other in the world will tell you what it is they are really hostile towards in the Christian faith. It is because they consider us morally repressive and restrictive of this kind of indulgence. And I want to say to you something. I became a Christian at the age of 17. I played cricket for my university. I played cricket in a local club. I was very competitive in sports. I didn't know a single Christian on my cricket team or my hockey team. They're all Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists. I some of them may be Indian. Not one of them would have read that article and found comfort or inspiration. They would have all said, this is bizarre and perverted. But the Christian faith takes the hit for it. And so what we are really living with at this time is a kind of sensually driven culture that has actually come to believe that you find your nirvana or your muksha or your salvation in indulging in this body in any form you want to indulge. You will find happiness in it. Yet read the life stories of people like Ernest Hemingway and others who ultimately lived out to a total life of impotence and found that the most frustrating part of them was that the very thing they lived for had nothing to give for them anymore. This is what we're up against. We're up against a young culture that has spent itself and exploited the human body to a point of, yeah, we all fail. As young people, we all struggle. We all think there is some hope in something. And where you talk to people and you see they come away empty-handed, disconsolate, guilt-ridden and pained by all of the things that they indulged in. And yet you go to the intellectual bastions and that is their answer for nirvana and hope. And so it was in 1974 when Malcolm Muggeridge resigned from, Saint Gilles, from the University of Edinburgh and gave his farewell address there at St. Giles. This is what he said. So dear Edinburgh students, this may well be the last time I address you. And this is what I want to say to you, and I don't really care whether it means anything to you or not. And whether you think there is anything in it or not, I want you to believe in that this row I have had with, it all had to do, by the way, at that time in the 70s, of handing out condoms free to the university students. And so he says this, I want you to believe 
uh, that this row that I have had with your elected officials has nothing to do with any puritanical attitudes on my part. I have no belief in abstinence for abstinence's own sake. No wish under any circumstances to check any fulfillment of your life and being. But I have to say to you this, that whatever life is or is not about, I think this is the line that I love so much. Whatever life is or is not about, it is not to be expressed in terms of drug stupefaction and casual sexual relations. However else we may venture into the unknown, it is not, I assure you, on the plastic wings of Playboy magazine or psychedelic fancies. This was a man who'd lived on the other side of the tracks and is telling the young, it's not where you're going to find it. Whatever life is or is not about, it's not about casual sexual relations and psychedelic fancies. And yet we've got a whole generation moving in that direction. All over the world. One of my favorite professors in my graduate days was Carl F. H. Henry, one of the most brilliant theologians, American theologians of years gone by. I remember in one of his books he said this, and I wondered, wow, this is something for Henry to be saying it. I wonder why he's saying it this way, but he did. He said this in his book, Christian Mindset in a Secular Society. Biblical truth, transcultural as it is, has an indispensable message for contemporary culture. It addresses modern learning, modern ethics, modern political economic concerns, and all the idolatries of our polytheistic society. It proclaims the gospel to a generation that is intellectually uncapped, morally unzippered, and volitionally uncurbed. Those who consider the latest fads permanently in will, of course, dismiss the Christian message as the last hurrah of an antiquated outlook. They reveal their sickness of soul by derogating terms like morality, piety, family, work, patriotism, born-again, evangelical theology. Christianity they dismiss as a kind of middle-class hedonism, declaring it intellectually inadmissible. They meanwhile espouse a life that neither reason nor conscience or spirit can support or condone. Repression of sensuality or self-gratification they call psychotically abnormal. Subordination of the flesh they leave to medieval monks or consigned to the future resurrection. Affirming sexual pleasure to be the supreme good of a life of unending revelry, they waste away into ethical ghosts and skeletons. So it is. So who we got railing against our president? Hollywood. Hollywood has hardly been a symbol of puritanical virtues. <laughs> the only time they criticized too much violence on the, scre on the screen was when Mel Gibson's movie came about on the crucifixion. They said that was too violent. That was the first miracle that movie attained, by the way, getting Hollywood to think it was too violent. wasting away into ethical ghosts and skeletons. We are living at a time where our children and grandchildren are going to be told they make their choices on all of these matters. There are no absolutes, nothing at all to which they need to get anyone else's advice or permission. There is the indulgence of the physical but there is then the seduction of the intellectual. What has happened is not so much that people are driven in this direction. We all struggle, we face these issues, I realize that. But the intellectuals today have railroaded this thing and commandeered relativism into a camp where anybody who believes in any norms and any absolutes is considered unfit for contemporary society. That they are dinosaurs they ought to be gotten rid of. And yet I'll tell you what, our team will tell you when we go out there and speak, and even on these matters, the young people, especially the young women, are living, listening with riveted attention. They know what you are saying is right. They just don't seem to have the power and the will to honor that. I remember two young gals at one of the leading universities, Vince was with me, he'll remember this very well. The gal came up right up to the platform and she was asking her question and we knew what her question was and what her lifestyle was and what she was driving to. But she was extremely respectful. She had gained our respect in the process and was raising her question. And I could see the tears going down her face as she was asking her question about her personal struggle. And Vince did a marvelous job after I finished answering. And then she asked if she could come to the back and speak to us, she and another young gal. And there they were with tears running down their face, admitting to what it was that their real battle was. 
and then paid us the great compliment and so would you two men mind if we took our pictures with you there they were standing next to us of a completely different worldview completely different habit in life knowing that they didn't have the answers but desperately needed it through Christ as we had the privilege of praying with them this intellectual hijacking of hedonism today and giving it some credibility so you've got the marvelous minds in all these halls of learning who are so relativistic and hedonistic in their pleasures and so anti-christian in their approach paul johnson in his book intellectuals probably overstates it somewhat but he makes this point one of the principal lessons of this tragic century which has seen so many millions of innocent lives sacrificed in schemes to improve the lot of humanity is beware of intellectuals. Not merely should they be kept well away from the levers of power, they should also be objects of particular suspicion when they seek to offer collective advice. Beware of committees, conferences and leagues of intellectuals. Distrust public statements issued from their serried ranks. Discount their verdicts on political leaders and important events for intellectuals far from being highly individualistic and non-conformist people follow certain patterns of behavior taken as a group they are often ultra conformist within the circles formed by those whose approval they seek and value that is what makes them a mass so dangerous for it enables them to create climates of opinion and prevailing orthodoxies which themselves often generate irrational and destructive course of action above all we must at all times remember what intellectuals habitually forget that people People matter more than concepts and must come first. The worst of all despotisms is the heartless tyranny of ideas. It was the French philosophes, the French intellectuals, who drove ultimately till splendor rode hard or till, uh, till victims were riding hard on the backs of splendor and so on and might became right and all of the words and the guillotine and all that came about, came about on the heels of so much intellectual rejection of the absolute and the value of ultimate human life. And so we have the attraction of the physical, the seduction of the intellectual, which brings me to my closing here. We really have to have three very simple responses. They have been addressed. So I'll just mention the first two and apply the third in our mission. Why are we here? Why are we here? What does this organization exist for? Why do our churches exist? What is my life amounting to? Why does RZIM exist? As it turns out, within a few days, I'll be celebrating my 71st birthday. Entering your seventh decade of life is a grim reminder that you're closer to the finishing point than to the starting point. You recognize the years have gone by so quickly. So I ask myself the question, what is it now I want to focus upon? There's something within me that prompts me to say, your work is done. Your work is now done. You have labored hard for over four decades in the vineyard. Shut the suitcases, sit at home, go down to your desk, write, enjoy the family every day. Oh, it is so attractive a thought. Then I look at the world around me and I say to myself, what is my mission in life? What did God call me for? Why did he rescue me from hospital bed? I look at it and I say, it is to be in the arena where the battles are being fought and to try and win the best of the youth today to change their world and to change the world to come. And I believe we are going to see it happen. We are already seeing it. Abdul Murray is here for us to be at Michigan State University on a weeknight with 9,500 in attendance and the basketball game suffered in attendance because the kids were attending this open forum. <laughs> and the lineup and the lineup and the lineup and the questions and the questions and the questions. What is my mission? Number two, what is our method? Our method is to lock eye contact with people and tell them we love them. You know, one of the best things about knowing Os Guinness is telling people that you know Os Guinness. <laughs> and now 
I ask you this. There are worlds of scholars who would give anything to have two hours of his time. To have a mentored leader like Edmund Chan in demand all over the world, for him to take 72 hours just to come and spend 24 hours of each flying from Singapore here just to be with us because we're friends. The people who long to be with them. We meet people eyeball to eyeball. We are in their arena and that's what shocks them. That's what shocks them. Our method will always be to be the light and to be there in the darkness and be there eyeball to eyeball. I cannot tell you the number of letters that I get from young people who say, well, there's one here just today who was talking to me saying, I struggled with my faith, struggled with my faith. Your program came on at just the right time and rescued me. That's our method. We will love people. We will value and treasure the gospel and we will remind them it's the only way to change life and to find redemption and hope and build a secure home for the future, our mission and our method. And lastly, it is our message. What is our message? Our message is very clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know, Billy Graham, if he lives to the end of this year, will be 99, I think. He was born in 1918. Yeah, he turned 99 in November. He set his face like a flint. My dear friend Cliff Barrows passed away recently. He lived here for some time and we used to have wonderful times with him. Dr. Graham fulfilled his mission as an evangelist. God has called us as this team. We've got the Luthers, we've got the Zwingli's, we've got the Calvins, we've got the Melanchthons as part of this team. World changes. Some of the young, young women and the young men in this team amaze me with the humility of heart and with the depth of their knowledge, we've got the same message and the same ethos. A whole team goes to a place and people look at this team and say, I don't believe what I'm seeing. Such a diversity of cultures, ethnicities, intellectual rigor, but same compassion and love for people who've come to know Jesus Christ through this team. And so I close with a very simple illustration this building is great and we look forward to thousands coming through it. I will hardly be here except when I'm here to teach. I'm gone most of the time. To many of you, I want you to know I haven't been to every floor of this building myself. <laughs> it's true. When people ask me, I said the other, I just came here yesterday and lost my way. I couldn't find my car. I went in the wrong direction. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. These things don't mean anything to me. They really don't. What it means to me is that there'll be a place that people can come where there'll be a light on to take them away from their darkness. That's what this is all about. Several years ago, when we were in Delhi, we'd finished a long series of trips. One thing about Margie, she may pray a lot for me, but she keeps me praying a lot for her too. She's lost her purses in more places <laughs> than ought to be allowed legally. So we're in Delhi. We're taking a 1 a.m. flight and about 10 p.m. at night, she's getting ready and she says, I can't find my purse. I said, you gotta be kidding me. I said, when did you last see it? She said, I don't remember. She said, maybe when we were out shopping in the afternoon at three o'clock, we ate at a roadside cafe in Delhi at three o'clock. And that was the last she'd seen it. It's now 10 p.m. in Delhi, and we've got to catch a flight. She said, my papers, my passport, everything is in there. That's right. You thought of it, you know. So we get into the, my friend's brother. I said, take me to Connaught Place. He said, what? He said, they close about 8 o'clock. They're all gone. I said, take me to Connaught Place. So we get into the car because we're going to go to the, hut, to the airport from there. Why? I don't know. She didn't have her papers. So we get into the car, to the car and we're driving and we arrive in this dark street called Janpath, which means the path of the people. There are hundreds of shops back to back, all in darkness, everything in darkness. And my heart is beating and we arrive closer and closer to where this roadside cafe was. I said, drop me off here. 
So I get off and walk about 20 paces in this tent wall. I open that and I look and there's a light on. I said, I don't believe what I'm seeing. So I walked over towards that light and he stood up. He said, Saab, Saab, aap ke liye rahe Sir, sir, I've been waiting for you. He said, Teen baje se rahe I've been waiting for you from three o'clock. He said, we ran after you, but you got into a taxi and went. Mame Saab, madam, left her purse. I said, I know. <laughs> he said, because of what was in there, I knew you would come back. I said, I'm amazed. I said, thanks for leaving that light on and staying here. I said, what can I do for you? He said, just one thing. I said, what is that? I thought he was going to ask me for money. He said, just write me a letter that this was lost in my restaurant and you came back seven and a half hours later and I was here waiting for you and you found it. That's all I want from you. Next year, we went back to Delhi. I went to that restaurant and behind this little chair is my letter <laughs> pinned on that. Room. He had the light on in a very dark situation all around us. What hope a little light can give when what you've lost is very precious for you to find. RZIM will keep its lights on. We will have a light on here in a dark world that's sensually driven, that's intellectually gone wrong. But the fact of the matter is we know what the mission is, we know what the method is, and we know what our message is, but without you, we can't do it, and you are a living proof of why it is we are all here even tonight. May God richly bless you. And I just want to close by saying this. The most important aspect of this event was not this building. It was for us to find the right leader. And when Vince and Joe accepted our call, I knew the deal was closed. I had to get Michael's permission because he's a strong force at Orca with Michael and Amy Ora Ewings. So Michael, thank you so much for sparing Vince and Joe. They're gonna be an amazing bright light in this place. Tomorrow we'll have a time of prayer for them and their whole team. But to know that somebody like at the Vince is at the helm gives me the greatest peace and the greatest fulfillment to know that a young man of his caliber, his intellectual rigor, and his passionate heart for evangelism will be directing the program from here. That is almost like a father and son's heart relationship to know that it'll be in good hands. So we need to pray for them that they will stay the course. Vince, come and pray for us in closing now. Thank you and God bless you. Amen. Uh, we have an incredible message to share. And our experience uh, here at RZIM is that when we take people's questions seriously, when we invite people to Christ, uh, many, often the people that we least expect, are ready to say yes to that invitation. Uh, we recently had an event, and just afterwards there was a man named Tom who uh, said that he wanted to put his faith in Jesus Christ and a number of our team had the privilege of standing around him as he did so and he prayed a simple uh, but genuine prayer asking for God's forgiveness and asking for God to come into his life and right after he had prayed that prayer and he opened his eyes the very first words out of his mouth were I have always had to wear a mask but now this is the first time in my life that I can take off that mask and I can be fully myself, and I can be fully alive. And no theory can do that, uh, no worldview can do that, no product can do that, only Jesus can do that. Let me just return as we end to the question we began the night with. How many of our neighbors, how many of our friends, our co-workers, how many of our family members would join us in Christ if we took their questions and objections seriously? And we invited them into the message of forgiveness and grace that Jesus offers. Let's find out. 
If you're a Christian, is there anyone in your life whom you've never invited? And if you're watching tonight and you're not a Christian, and you're not confident of where you stand with God, let me invite you. Let me invite you into the life that you were made for. Let me invite you into the great purposes and plans that God has for you. Let me invite you to be fully yourself and to be fully alive. Jesus invites us with the words, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Why don't we close this evening in prayer? Lord, as I stand in this building that's been set apart for your purposes, I marvel at your generosity. Lord, everything comes from you. We've given to you only what already comes from your hand. Lord, please keep our hearts loyal to you. In you alone is success found. In you alone can the heart be healed. You alone are the message that brings life. May everyone who works and studies here be known for their humility, their integrity, their honesty, their kindness. Lord, fill us with your grace so that every person who attends this institute would know that they matter to you and that they are loved deeply by you. Lord, as we contend for the faith that you have entrusted to us in a world that is not always receptive to it, may we be known by our radical love for those who disagree with us. Finally, God, there are those watching tonight who have never put their trust in you. I believe some of them will know tonight deep in their hearts that it is time to. And so I want to join them right now, Lord, in confessing to you how often I have failed to live up to the life of love and courage that you have called me to, how often I have turned my back on you. And tonight, I symbolically open the door that I can hear you knocking on. I ask you to come into my life and to help me to take off whatever masks I've been living with and to be fully myself and fully alive as I follow you, the giver of all life and of life in all of its fullness. Lord, I pray all of these things with deep gratitude in my heart and I trust you for them and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. To all of you watching, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for standing with us in prayer. And we look forward to seeing you at the Zacharias Institute very soon. God bless you.